Okay, thank you. So hello, everyone. Uh, good to meet you all. Uh, I don't know if this is at the tail end of the day. Hopefully it is. <laughs> and you guys go get to the party. Uh, and so this is going to be a little bit of a lighter uh, subject in the sense that it's not too technical. It basically talks about uh, what we believe to be the future of uh, AutoML uh, and how Gen AI helps uh, you know make that vision happen. Uh, we've been in the, uh, in this space for the last five years. Actually, Colin, uh, who is uh, you know an organizer of the conference, used to work at Abacus. He, as well as a lot of the research team at Abacus, has worked on AutoML as well as um, uh, you know published a whole bunch of papers in that area. You can go to our website abacus.ai and click on the research tab. You'll be able to see that uh, we've worked on all kind of uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, ideas around neural architecture search, as well as uh, looking at uh, even foundation models uh, when it comes to AutoML. Um, we've actually released a new paper around that called Forecast PFN, so that's there too, so you can check that out. But today we're basically going to talk about this overall theme of how uh, you know, we think applied AI systems will, uh, so, you know, will be coded or will uh, will exist in the future. And let's talk a little bit about Gen AI. A lot of this is high level, probably something which most of you already know about. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. Uh, so uh, of course, Gen AI, uh, generative AI has taken off uh, in a very, very big way. <clears throat> We see uh, LLMs being applied in pretty much every single, uh, uh, you know, facet of uh, 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 facet of business. We see that it's in different functional areas, all the way from sales to HR to legal. Uh, I, I would say there's about ten uh, um, companies being started on a daily basis, which are focused around LLMs today. Uh, just uh, as a, a background to this, of course, I'm sure all of you have used GPT-4, ChatGPT. It's super delightful. They're greater generation. We know that they have an issue with hallucinations. Nation. And they're really great at information retrieval. And really, we think the big market here is around search and basically having search being completely redone in some way uh, with LLMs kind of backing up. So again, this is uh, probably, again, not new to most of you. Uh, uh, large language models have evolved over the last few years, uh, you know, and we have a few key players here. We have Google, who you know, actually started with that key invention, which is attention all is, is all you need. Um, good for us, they actually published that paper, and so all of us uh, got to like kind of uh, uh, you know iterate around that. Uh, and then we have OpenAI with the GPT series and Meta, of course, and Abacus actually does a lot of LLM research work right now as well. Uh, and Meta, of course, came out with Llama One and Llama Two. Uh, we are not GPU rich. Uh, in a way that OpenAI and Google are, and I think most of you uh, probably aren't in that say aren't in that same space as well. Meaning you aren't GPU rich, don't have thousands of G, uh, GPUs. But uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest now with uh, smaller LLMs such as Llama One and Llama Two, uh, and actually kind of modifying, tweaking, and tuning them to be kind of enterprise friendly. And Abacus is a very big player in that uh, world. We actually released um, a new. Uh, uh, version of Llama 2, a fine-tuned version, which actually increases context length uh, from 2K, which is what Llama 2 comes uh, out of box uh, with 2K context length. Uh, our version right now has a 32K context length, which is really useful in the enterprise space. I will talk to that a little bit more as we go through this talk. So, you know, we all know there's open source models. Uh, such as Llama 1, Llama 2, and then there are these closed source models, which are much bigger uh, and which, you know, at the moment, at least the most performant model uh, is this very large GPT-4 model by OpenAI. Uh, our thesis is that over time, open source foundation models will become as performant, if not be, uh, more performant than closed source. So right now, when you think about it, we are very much on the uh, left side of this graph. Uh, open source is not as performant, though the newest benchmarks of Falcon 180B as well as Llama 2 aren't as bad, and usually they come up to be as performant as GPT 3.5. So we do think that generally in the LLM space, uh, and we apply a lot of these open source LLMs, we do a lot of benchmarks and comparisons, especially when it comes to what we're calling AI-assisted data science. I'll talk about that a little in a little bit. But it turns out that um, you know, code Llama and some of these open source code gen models tend to be pretty effective as well, especially around code generation and things like that. And so we think over time, we're going to see open source performance come up. And we've seen that in the past. Uh, and we think we'll actually you know, be as good. I mean, there is basically talk about uh, uh, Falcon 180B and some of these newer models being actually as good as GPT-4. We'll see. 
but um, we will hopefully surpass a closed source. And of course, I think that's really good for the community. We want transparent models. We want people to um, you know, uh, innovate and iterate on these models. Uh, LLMs have be basically uh, been really great at brute forcing it. Uh, this is why there is a severe shortage of GPUs, uh, especially the H100s from NVIDIA recent uh, in the market. Uh, everybody wants, uh, you know, um, a GPU farm to train their like uh, LLM. And uh, over time, what we've seen, of course, is performance has improved as the model has, as the models have gotten bigger and bigger in terms of parameters. Um, the only kind of, uh, you know, uh, new, the new age models like the Llama models tend are smaller. And they are showing performance, which is as good as even four or 500 billion parameters. So that is encouraging, which means that we don't need that much compute. We don't need that much inference power. And you can actually run these models, uh, you know, uh, as long as you have a couple of few H100s uh, and they can be effective. And that's what we're seeing uh, with Abacus and with some of our enterprise deployments where companies will be like, hey, I want to use... Um, uh, I want to fine tune my own LLM or I want to use my own LLM because I don't really want to send my data over the internet to OpenAI or Google. Uh, there, there is a um, you know, market for those kinds of models. But long story short, we've seen um, LLMs basically uh, grow in size over the last few years and GPT-4 being extremely uh, effective at what it does. Uh, everybody's uh, been delighted by LLMs and the reason is uh, the various different things it can do, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're able to not just generate text, everybody's obviously used chat GPT, but also the other things uh, which LLMs are used for today. And again, uh, uh, over at Abacus, we use it for all of these different use cases, whether it's classifying text documents, searching over uh, a large amount of data, summarizing uh, uh, information, rewriting, uh, you know, code, rewriting blog posts and so on. It's been pretty effective at, at a lot of these use cases. The thing that we want to focus on with respect to applied AI systems is code generation. This is actually the killer use case for LLMs. Uh, I mean, if anybody has tried Code Interpreter or any of these things, or of course, uh, you know, the GitHub Autopilot, you know that it's been actually pretty useful in terms of actually uh, writing and generating code. It also turns out that it's not just useful in code generation, that LLMs are really good at data analytics as well. So think about what a data scientist does. Um, you know, they do a lot of like analysis on the data. They, you know, usually there's some database on the back end. Uh, typically, actually, when it comes to machine learning systems, uh, we're talking um, data warehouses, things like Snowflake or BigQuery. Uh, you have multiple tables. Um, the data is across these different tables. Uh, people basically want to look at this data, visualize this data, understand what the issues of the data are, and then create like a machine learning friendly data set, right? Uh, and then that machine learning friendly data set is then sent over to AutoML. And um, what LLMs actually tend to be good at uh, and we've done a lot of analysis, and I, I'll show you some of that stuff as well, is um, they not only are good at um, you know, producing Python code uh, to do data transformations and visualization, they're also very good at kind of understanding the data and seeing how, how clean it is or whether there are issues with it um, when it comes to like preparing the data for machine learning. So imagine if you know, some of the data doesn't have, isn't like configured as a string and some of it is like numbers, LLMs are good at identifying those issues or missing values is another key, easy, simple thing which LLMs can easily identify and say, hey, 20% of your data has missing values. So we uh, at Abacus, this is the, uh, you know, basic uh, premise vision behind Abacus. Uh, the idea is that, and this is an auto ML conference, I believe everybody here is with me, uh, which is that AI, not humans, will build applied AI systems. Uh, and uh, there is a lot to building an applied AI system. The way auto ML is defined today, in some ways, it's actually quite narrow. Right. Uh, in a lot of research right now is focused on trying to find the best algorithm or the best neural net given a data set. And it tends to be that these data sets are already prepared for machine learning. They're ready to go. Uh, you know, they're cleaned in some ways. And if you look at like the various different benchmark benchmarks that AutoML has, um, you know, most of the data sets that you look at and you know for those benchmarks, they again tend to be quite neat, quite clean, very researchy data sets. Uh, and but when you look at the real world. There's a lot of stuff which goes on before and after building the model, uh, before you can actually deploy an, apply, uh, deploy an applied AI system in production. Uh, and that is, you know, the first part, of course, is like 
looking at the data, understanding it, cleaning, visualizing it. Um, and then after that, you're basically doing feature selection and that can be automated uh, to a great extent. Then you basically have AutoML, which actually trains the model. And then afterwards, there's a second part, which is like you deploy the model, you want to monitor it, you want to monitor drift, you want to redeploy it. If the, you know, if the model is drifting. So there's kind of an end-to-end -end system which has a lot of different pieces. Uh, and the, uh, our vision is AI is going to be able to take care of these pieces end-to-end. -end. It can understand the data, it can extract the patterns, it can deploy these models, and it can redeploy them if you need to. So how is that going to happen, right? Uh, and so our first thesis is that you actually need a enterprise scale end-to-end um, -end LLM ops or ML ops system. And this is most of you, if you're if you have like built out something in production for some company, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, basically you have data sets and the data sets refresh over time. So nothing stays uh, stable, or, you know, things change over time. So we're talking about building pipelines. So basically we need to be able to get new data as it comes in. We need to be able to retrain models as the data becomes stale. We will need to, able to, we need to be able to get predictions and those predictions can either be through a prediction dashboard, through a batch prediction, um, you know, a job which runs on a regular basis or real-time predictions. And then you want to be able to monitor this old whole process end to end and this is a very fragile brittle process right because you know fundamentally the model is based on your data anytime you have any issue with your data which can happen again at any time uh, you're going to have a, a breakage in the system and you want something which is monitoring the system make ensuring that you know the data is up to date as well as like you know the right steps or we're doing the right pre-processing steps so you can build those models so our first thesis is you can't really build anything which is enterprise scale without an end-to-end -end ML ops or LLM ops system, right? And this is very similar in some ways to what the big tech companies are saying. So I'm not saying something totally like out of whack here. If you look at, say, an AWS or a GCP, um, they all have their own versions of this. I'm sure like some of you have heard of SageMaker or Vertex. And the difference between, let's say, us and um, uh, Abacus and them is that our MLOps system is, is a very cohesive end-to-end -end, um, kind of uh, uh, you know, infrastructure, which kind of, where each module kind of leads to the other. If you've used Vertex or SageMaker, you'll know that there are different modules that kind of like Lego bricks, which you'll have to put together on the fly based on your problem or use case. But long story short, I think more, most people believe that we need one of these systems where you can actually kind of, you know, track your models, set up your data pipelines, set up drift, track drift and so on. So basically all the pieces have to be somewhere uh, and these pieces have to be monitored and these things will change. So you'll have different versions. So it's not like, you know, set it and forget it. It's not one and done. It's one of those things where you have to keep on refreshing your models, understanding your predictions and so on. Okay. So, um, because of that, we believe strongly that you need to have, uh, uh, you know, not only that end to end system, but it also kind of makes auto and auto ML inevitable. Okay, here's why. Because if you're going to like have to build a model each time you have new data, it isn't, it isn't like a logically sensible thing for your data scientist to come in every single time there is a drift, look at what's happening, understand that drift, and go rebuild the model, right? It's just not sustainable. And this is what we see in the industry today on an ongoing basis. What we see is that uh, uh, we see users basically coming in and saying, hey, uh, my model, like which I built like six months ago, is no longer working and there's drift and what am I going to do? And so if you don't build it on a system, A, which is kind of trackable, where you can track all of this and track all the pipelines, and B, uh, where you don't use AutoML, you're going to have a lot of like kind of data science uh, intervention, which is required on an ongoing basis. And what's even worse is that in the industry, you'll see a data scientist build the model, uh, you know, put it in production and then leave, leave the company. And then if there's a lot of details in that model, then you're, you know, you're done for in some ways because, you know, you don't understand, uh, like the new person needs to understand all the nitty gritty or needs to understand all the feature engineering, needs to understand, you know, why certain features were left in or left out. And so that's, we think that makes a very, very strong case for AutoML. And I think more and more companies, and this used to not be the case when we first started the company in 2019, we're seeing this big shift where more and more companies are kind of basically accepting AutoML to be um, the norm versus, um, you know, uh, uh, versus the um, uh, exception. 
Uh, when you look at AutoML, the way uh, we want to define this uh, is uh, there are like, you know, technically, if you look at it, uh, there is neural architecture search. We've done a lot of research on that, which is finding the best neural architecture given a data set. This works exceptionally well when you have larger data sets uh, for certain types of problems. In fact, you know, we, um, uh, Abacus solves for like different types of tabular data problems as well as uh, language and vision, where this really excels at is time series forecasting and personalization. Uh, it, it's almost always a neural net, which, uh, which uh, competes and wins over all the other types of algorithms we have. Um, and so it's very effective neural architecture search there is the way to go, uh, especially with forecasting, which is one of the biggest use cases in the industry. Uh, then HPO, of course, is hyperparameter optimization. In fact, this is absolutely necessary, whether it is um, a neural net or whether it's a tree model which wins, um, you know, we at Abacus, and I'll just show you that, actually uh, use different, for us, AutoML basically first means, um, you know, running the model on, uh, or running different algorithms, training different models based on different algorithms, tree-based algorithms, classical uh, ML algorithms like matrix factorization, or even statistical models for forecasting, like ARIMA and uh, PROFIT. And then, of course, um, you know, we're big fans of neural nets. And so, of course, the neural nets, right? And mostly, most of our architectures now are transformer architectures, but uh, we also have RNNs and stuff like that. And so, HPO is the second piece uh, of this, which is hey, you have to optimize your um, neural net to be effective. So to mention what works in the real world, so Abacus has hundreds of customers right now. Uh, we, we think we're pretty successful. Uh, and uh, our approach is obviously, we've always been an, by nature, like uh, our DNA has been an, uh, to be an auto ML company. Uh, what we have realized though, is data sets are of different sizes. Uh, and so it's really important not just to be focused on NAS or not just to be focused on HPO. You have to try different algorithms uh, for a particular problem type. So the way we think about machine learning is we think about there being a few problem types. Uh, and the problem types are things like time series forecasting, personalization, classification, and regression for predictive modeling, and so on, or NLP, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then each problem type has its own set of algorithms. And based on the size and the shape of the data set, you might have a winning algorithm, which is different from, say, uh, you know, a different, um, uh, uh, you know, data. For example, uh, trees might win for, let's say, a tire company. Uh, we are working with a tire company for now, and I think trees is one of their uh, winning models. But then we have neural nets winning exclusively for this fashion company, uh, which does retail forecasting. And so different models make different sense. You want to be able to train these models, uh, train these different algorithms, and pick the algorithm which makes the most sense. And I'm just this is giving giving you a quick flavor of what I mean by um, you know training different uh, algorithms, doing HPO, doing NAS, and that sort of thing. Highly untrivial to do this or non-trivial to do this, um, you know, on a standalone basis, which is, again, an argument for having a system. Uh, you will see that this is a forecasting model. It just does a six-month forecast. A really quick overview of our dashboard here. You're seeing the winning model to be uh, a transformer-based model. You see the number of metrics we're reporting because different companies care for various different metrics. These are pretty much like, you know, covers the whole gamut of forecasting metrics. Um, you also see on here with the various different types of like algorithms we're applying, various different ML uh, neural network algorithms, ensembles, ensembles tend to do pretty well. Tree-based algorithms, uh, the, these do well if um, you have a lot of features, especially for time series, um, or if you have smaller data sets. Uh, and then we also have a few, um, if you go down, you'll see them. Uh, we also have a few, um, statistical models like ETS, which is of course a very popular algorithm. And the neural nets are actually so effective that more often than not, the beat is very substantial. So you will see that uh, if you look look at some of the metrics, they're dif differing by a lot. I mean, if you look at say, for example, MAPE, uh, that's at 280% on the last one and you go all the way up. Um, it's uh, 241. So you see that they actually, you know, do much better. Uh, this one at 219, but there is quite a bit of difference in terms of like the metrics. So different, again, uh, different algorithms win for different data sets. Uh, we report on all the metrics. Customers can choose whichever metric makes sense for them. Uh, and then the other big piece here is, well, the algorithm is uh, one, uh, you know, one part of the equation. The other very, very big part of the equation that we found uh, is uh, feature selection. 
And so this is again something which I think to the AutoML audience here, I would I would strongly recommend that you start kind of thinking about AutoML in a much bigger context and at least add feature selection to it, because a lot of data scientists are going to be like, hey, you know, without feature selection, selection, I think it's kind of like, okay, you know, not that great because I have to do all the hard work anyway, right? Uh, and so one of the methods we use is uh, the Baruta method, which actually helps you pick which features might be um, most effective. So we, we actually employ the Baruta method and then do AutoML. So all of that is automated too. Uh, and, and this method is actually, is it okay? It's not great. We would love to see more methods, love to see more open source work on that. And then eventually, once you pick the algorithm, you uh, tune the hyperparameters. Okay, so that's the auto ML piece. Like I mentioned that that is just actually one piece, which is the model training piece. The struggle that we have is not there. The struggle that we have is in the data piece. This is the data visualization, the data wrangling, the data cleaning piece, right? And these data sets can be really big. They can be like <clears throat> multiple billions of rows uh, and can have literally thousands of columns. So the question is, how does how you know how are we going to work through this, and what do data scientists do? Uh, you know, Abacus tends to be like one of these auto ML platforms, and I think there are a few, in, there are a couple in the market where you have a lot of dashboards. So every data set is automatically uh, you know dashboarded, so we get like an automatic dash uh, dashboard for every data set version, and you can see things like. Um, missing columns, mean, median, and all of the standard kind of like uh, data set metrics you would see when you upload this data. And you also will see distributions and things like that. So as a data scientist, you can just look at it and you know, get, get a feel for the data, like how good is the data, how complete is it, you know, what are, what are my distributions looking like, and so on. Uh, you also want, I mean, similar to that dashboarding feature, we also like do this for data sets before we start modeling them and also for like models after. So we want to like look at things like prediction drift, training drift. So there's a bunch of dashboards across the whole platform where you can look at what is going on throughout the life cycle of that platform, of the model. Then finally, a quick, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a hat tip to uh, interpretability, which also I think, if you think about auto ML and kind of think about like applied AI systems, which are auto automated, one of the things that you really want to think about is people saying, hey, this is too black boxy for me. The system is doing everything. It's selecting features, it's cleaning the data, it's training the model. And, you know, if you're doing all of that, how do I know what is going on? And so therefore interpretability becomes a really, really big deal. I don't know if you guys were there at the panel like a couple of hours ago, uh, there was this big question around it. So again, uh, uh, you know, we strongly believe that part of this uh, automation should be automating based on things like uh, what are the different interpretable methods that are available, things like Shapley values, things like Lime, uh, as well as explainable uh, uh, boosting machines, all three methods uh, which are available and, and you know at least a couple of them work with neural networks. So the good news is it's easy to kind of also build that in, build in Shapley values, build in um, you know line into the system. So the system end to end is, hey, look at the data, understand it, uh, train the model, and then for predictions, make sure that there is interpretable um, uh, methods so that which can be surfaced for business users. So now that we have this end-to-end -end system and we have these different components, the next piece is to program this system. So, you know, I showed you these dashboards, I showed you the auto ML piece, but who is directing this platform and how does that work? So before Gen AI showed up, it was data scientists, right? Data scientists had to go use this platform and they had to go say, hey, this is how the platform is helping me. So if I were to use a notebook and go work on my own, uh, maybe, you know, I would get my like uh, project done in like say a week uh, with Abacus or with any other like MLOps platform like this, maybe it would take like, let's say two days or whatever. And like in reality, if you want to put these things in production, it takes a longer time. Uh, but now here's the next like kind of invention, which is instead of the data scientist, can we have an LLM program the MLOps platform, right? And the fundamental point is as long as your MLOps platform is API first, so everything is addressable, all of those dashboards, all of those things are, are you know basically usable or like callable through an API, you can actually program the MLOps platform. You don't really need a human at that point. You can have an LLM potentially program that platform end to end. It can even, you know, the ultimate vision is it look, you, you point it to two tables in Snowflake and say, that's my user data, that's my user activity, go figure out churn. 
And like, you know, maybe in three or four hours, the LLM like pings you and says, hello, here is your churn model. And then you have an expert data scientist go and review the whole thing end to end. And voila, if it's as good, if not better than what the expert data scientist can do, you've completely automated the system end to end. You have, you know, alerting, you have tracking, you have monitoring. And we believe each of the pieces that I just mentioned is absolutely essential to get there in the real world. Uh, and so the last piece, AI assisted chat, right? Which is this idea like today, uh, you know, uh, we don't, we're not there yet. I can't press a button and go all the way. Uh, I can try, you can build an AI agent, but it doesn't work that well. Uh, you can't go press a button and go all the way from the tables to the churn model, but you can basically talk to the LLM and ask it to generate code or ask it to understand problems, ask it to plot and get all of these things done. So the basic idea there is to use kind of like Gen AI in co in combination with uh, uh, you know with the uh, uh, AutoML to build up lights AI systems, right? So this is AI chat which works with an abacus. You can ask things like, what is the distribution of the sales column? It can actually look in our feature group. Feature group, think of that as a data set. Uh, you know, it can load the feature group. It can actually draw a plot and it can give you the results, right? And it can actually tell you, what, you know, what are the issues with the data? It can actually train models. So AI chat is basically configured on top of abacus AI to automatically do a whole bunch of things that data scientists do. And our inter our customers, as well as our internal data scientists use AI chat now more, more and more and more to build out their applied AI systems and, and kind of rely on their um, you know uh, AI chat to kind of at least give them the code or give them the various different pieces uh, which are necessary to build out that system as opposed to having to write things on their own. So I think from on a zero to 10 scale, if the you know final goal was to completely automate everything, with AI chat, we're around 6.5 to 7. And the next step, and you, you see this little player there, uh, I'm not going to press it because it's going to take forever anyway. Uh, that's actually the player which is actually trying to automate the whole thing. It's guessing the next prompt, the next thing to do. So it's not just chat at that point. It's basically running a sequence of prompts to actually say, hey, I, my original, um, give me a goal. And if that is like seven, seven or 10 or 15 prompts, I'm going to run that one after the other and build my churn model. So that's why we have that player and that thing that's still in beta but AI chat, which is prompting uh, the system to do analysis, to do find missing data, to select features, to train models is alive and kicking and actually does a pretty good job. Again, it's not 100% because this is Gen AI. Uh, it, this thing still hallucinates, I would say, but we're at a good 80% right now. 80, 85%, it gets things right. And so this really combines both of that. Uh, and you know, it can do data transformation, EDA, model training, model eval, deployment, uh, you know, the full thing. This really also kind of puts us at a 10x uh, efficiency increase for data science. Uh, you see a lot of like these things now automated because of AI chat combined with AutoML, combined with this MLOps platform. Uh, we're calling this AI-assisted data science. We think hopefully that that term will catch on. Um, and the idea there, again, is to use um, language prompts alongside AutoML to go off and build these end-to-end -end systems. That's it, I think. That's the end of my talk. Uh, any questions? Yeah, we have a few questions. Uh, all right. Okay, hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so great. Uh, thanks for the really great talk. Um, can you say something about the typical use cases for large language models your customer have? Like, do they fine tune their models or program their efficient fine tuning? Or do they just deploy? you know, some open source model as an endpoint. Okay, yeah, no, typical uh, data source uh, use cases for LLMs actually happen to be uh, contract uh, extraction. That's the single biggest use case we have. Everybody has a bunch of contracts. There's a lot of like, uh, 
you know, weird language in there. They want to extract key terms, store that in a database. Um, the other one is a bunch of lawyers, actually. We have a whole bunch of legal firms who also want to automate kind of like creating letters. They have all kinds of like legal letters, if you, as you can imagine. And they want uh, to be able to pick out a particular letter, type of letter, like, hey, send this like cease and desist letter. And they want to be able to, uh, you know, use that. So there's different actually use cases which are based on different uh, enterprises. The third one actually tends to be NER. Uh, which, you know, which you actually technically you can use BERT or something. You don't really need to use uh, a large language model, but LLMs do really well with uh, NER. Uh, and that's a very common use case. And then the fourth is, I would say, confluence-based wiki or internal search slash customer support. So these would be the four use cases as to uh, why you use uh, an open source LLM versus like a closed, I think a lot of times it's just you know, jitters, <laughs> they don't want to send uh, security, it doesn't want to send anything on the internet, um, the API, so they want to use some fine-tuned version. And so um, it's usually, right now, it's all Llama, actually, for us at least, uh, or some or Llama modified by Abacus. So we instruct tune the LLM uh, and then use that, and very less actual fine-tuning based on the specific use case, but more on the domain, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you are next. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, my question is about the time series foundation model which you mentioned as part of your panel also here in the beginning. Uh, what kind of base model did you choose because, uh, you know, in the context of thinking about foundation model, building a foundation model for image kind of unstructured data set, it's very different from building something for time series because some time series problems perform well with uh, neural networks and some are like more like tree-based models. How did you end up choosing a base model uh, for, for this uh, foundational model? So we didn't choose an LLM. Actually, Colin is better suited to answer this question than even me. Uh, so I don't believe we chose an LLM to as a base model for this foundation model. I'll send you the paper. I'm not sure exactly what uh, base model they used or if they trained something from scratch. Uh, it's definitely not based on a Llama 1 or Llama 2. It's more kind of a numerical time series model, which works basically based on like <laughs> you giving us a time series, which we expect to be seasonal and things like that, having some patterns. So think of it as a glorified ETS right now more than than anything else. Um, so it's just kind of dipping our toes into like seeing if something like time series forecasting can be a foundation model. And no, that's not intuitive, as you just said. So that's why it's kind of interesting. Uh, maybe a follow up. Do we also have an implementation for that, or is it like a closed? Uh... And there is an implementation. I, I think we also have code for it. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I can answer Sorry, more. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very simple transformer model, although built to be extremely flexible. And what sort of time series it can take in more so than the human model. And, and it's all it's all designed on the prior data fitted networks that get um from from Frank's lab. And uh, and yeah, the, the code is available. Um, yeah. Any other questions or or even online questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I can't hear you. Whoever it is, maybe come to the mic. Yeah, yeah. Um, did I understand you right that feature selection and model architecture selection are two separate steps? Because from our experience, the different types of model architectures need different types of feature preprocessing. And if you select the features beforehand, you do the model selection, you might not get the, the optimal features for the, the model architecture. Uh, like, uh, okay, so you're saying. Uh, is the question why are fe why is feature selection and modern architecture model architecture def step with steps? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway. Honestly, if there are, we, we're agnostic, let's put it this way. If like, for example, we also use autogluon, which I think may, may be doing some of its own feature selection. The catch is though that, you know, in a lot of, for example, when you're looking at trees, uh, you know, there is going, I mean, so our auto ML is kind of like a mixed auto ML, right? We do NAS as well. Before that, we also, tried like different algorithms. Like we try trees, we try, uh, you know, uh, we try matrix factorization, anything that makes sense. And so when it comes to like things like trees, feature selection actually plays a very important role, right? If you don't have certain features, it doesn't work. So we are basically saying, hey, first, you know, do some level of feature selection, Second, some do some level of like um, pick different algorithms. And then on top of that, we're doing mass. So that's kind of like, we're not preventing 
like some uh, some package or something which is useful which can do both that's great it can do uh, it can do more feature selection within it but the way it also works is we'll also send one um, the and i didn't show you that but you can flip a thing and you, we send one uh, data set where we don't do feature selection at all so the full data set along with all the features get sent to the auto ml piece which is the figuring out the model architecture piece and then another goes to that boruta method which i mentioned where a certain amount of features are picked so you get both and that's the advantage of automating this whole thing, right? You can do everything in parallel. And turns out that actually efficiency is not a big deal. I mean, we can run, like, for example, our forecasting, uh, uh, you know, when we run a forecasting run, it, we spin up, like, I think, 1,500 machines and run it all in parallel. So you get, like, kind of a glimpse of, like, what happens if you took, take all the features and send the feature selection and everything else downstream to the model architecture step and another where you're selecting features. I, I guess we're running a bit over time. Maybe either one more quick question or... Yeah, I also had a question online. Maybe we should take one online question. Okay, yeah. We'll, we'll okay. take one online question. Satcom, do you want to unmute? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks a lot, actually, uh, for the great talk. Um, I just have a question uh, about the uh, coding part, right? So um, we've been trying hard to get a model that's actually competitive with the uh, open source models. And uh, that Lord, has been... Model? Sorry, trying hard to get a model competitive with which model? With the open source models like Lama oh, Two, for, like yeah, like Lama Two, for example, and and it has been proven very hard, for example, to get RL to train on them, right? And uh, I mean, we think the reason is the sparsity of the reward and that the tokens are not correctly credit assigned. Uh, but do you have a word or two on, uh, you know, how could we get RL, let's say, to work better on on things related to problems like code generation or generally LLMs? <laughs> Good point, good question. I actually am not the person to speak to you about that because we haven't made our own code gen models work either. So we've struggled a little bit with that. Uh, Llama code, uh, of course, works, I think, quite well. GPT-4, by far, <laughs> I, I have to say, uh, is the best. And so for AI chat, we've done a lot of work on top of GPT-4. Like, think of this as more like, you know, kind of like understanding prompts and doing context and understanding APIs. And trying to do RL with code is uh, is been challenging. All right. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we're also model agnostic, right? Especially with AI chat, we just want something which works as opposed to it being our model. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. We're now going to move on. Let's thank the speaker <laughs> one more time.